blessing to you. It really was to us. That was our devotional on Christmas Day as a family. And uh, we were just really, really moved um, by that, <coughs> by, by that story, by uh, just the message in that, oh, come all, right, ye unfaithful. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, the broken, the dying, the outcast. And so if you feel like that today in any way, um, whether you're here in this room physically or at home virtually, you are a welcome guest in God's family. You are a, the one that the invitation is for. So we are so thankful for that. Um, <clears throat> a few things, uh, maybe, you know, maybe dad talk. I have these dad talks at times. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I enjoy, there's about two seasons in the church that I really, really enjoy. I love July in our church. I don't know why. Um, sometimes, you know, people are out of town or it's vacation, but I love July because people linger a lot and hang out a lot. Um, and historically, our church has grown quite a bit during the summers. And I just think it's wonderful that we're not so busy and so uh, moving at such a fast pace that I just, I just love July. And the other time that I really, really like in our church <coughs> is probably about this three to four week window that we're in right now, kind of like the last two Sundays of December and the first two sun Sundays of January are another kind of like favorite season for me in our church. And I think, again, it goes back to whether there are guest in town uh, that we get to see or just that people again are just at a slower pace and engage in a greater way um, and I love it but here comes my dad talk over the years of pastoral ministry I have seen probably those two seasons as much as I love them in the church those are the two seasons where most people are at most danger um, for, for just spiritual, a uh, spiritual falling, you know, um, I don't know about you, but I used to really mismanage my vacations. When we would go on vacation, some of the really hard things or, you know, even conversations with my wife would happen during a vacation. And I began to realize that when I'm in a rhythm and a weekly schedule and a routine, maybe there's demands in my life that drive me to the Word of God, whether I have to give a devotional or teach a Bible class or preach. These things are driving me, right, to be around God's Word. But then vacation comes, and you know, we have some college students uh, in the room now, and what you will, I think, recognize is that that can be one of the hardest times for you spiritually, right? The rhythm is gone, the schedule has been changed, and all of a sudden, you realize that you're actually struggling spiritually. <coughs> whether it's to be in the word, whether it's self-indulgence. Oh, I got free time now. Everything in my schedule is about me. My relaxation, my, you know, my desires, my wants. And I, I have found over the years that some of the hardest, probably when the bottom drops out of marriages and relationships, are the two windows that I gave you around July and this little window right here. You know, I've told, I've said it a lot and I know that it might, you know, cause people to be uncomfortable, but I believe the highest risk person in the church today is the young married couple. I've not, I've not seen it. I remember when I was a young married couple and, you know, I still am. No, I'm joking, but... Um, I remember talking to, you know, back in the day, and Trinette and I were, you know, where are we going to go to church, and how we're going to serve, and how we're going to get plugged in, and there was other couples that I would talk to, and that was just a common conversation. We're free. We don't have kids yet. Where do we serve? Where do we plug in? Young couples today, they just run from the church. They, you see them once every six months. Do they exist? Yes, they're there. And I don't know what it is, but our culture today, and I think Satan is attacking them. And if, if it's some, something that you should be praying for is for the young couples, because 
they have this freedom. They can do whatever they want. They can have banana pancakes on a Sunday morning. And they're some of the most at risk and threatened people that you will ever see in our church. And I think it's connected to what I'm telling you is because we don't know how to handle passive time. We don't know how to handle freedom. And I just, as a pastor, I encourage you, figure out with your family, with your spiritual life, how to be intentional in the windows of time when you have a lot of time on your hand, if that makes sense. And I just say that as a pastoral admonition because the phone calls I get and the sad situations that I have to respond to, this is the window. It's when there's passive time. And so I pray that God would help us all to learn how to use the freedom we have in Christ to draw closer to him and not be drawn away from him. So there's my dad talk. It literally came, I think, from the Holy Spirit during the message, I mean, during the worship time. And so I give that to you. And one of the things I love about this time of the year is I always will preach a sermon normally on the word of God. And Juan led us so well through the worship of that. And then I'm gonna preach on prayer. And our, one of our initiatives for 2021 will be on prayer. So we're going to be talking a lot about prayer in 2021. And what I want to do today is have you open up. We're going to read two passages. And then I'm just going to kind of launch from that and really try to give you a vision, an aspiration, an encouragement, a longing to be people of the Word of God. And so would you go to Mark chapter 7? Let's read that passage first, <coughs> excuse me, beginning in verse 1, and then we'll jump to Matthew chapter 5. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they had come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisee and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according, not to the word of God, but to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles mother, father or mother must surely die. But you say... If a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. Let's go to Matthew now, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 20. <clears throat> Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us today. Lord Jesus, we come to you now. Lord, longing to be in your word, especially after that wonderful worship time, God. We want to see Christ. And we know, God, that your word is design and it's, it's made for us to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so, God, would you do that today? God, do that for people who don't even maybe know where to go next in their life. Maybe they're just confused. Maybe they're in a state of paralysis. Maybe, God, they're 
in a moment of discouragement. Maybe God, they have drifted so much or messed up so much that they just feel like they shouldn't even be moving towards God. But would you encourage us that the invitation from Christ to us today is for those, God, who are drifting, who are unfaithful, who, God, need to be reconciled to God. And so, God, would you encourage us now May you reveal Christ. May you also reveal our hearts. And I do pray, God, one of my goals today is would you inspire people to long for your word? Would you give them, God, aspirations of knowing you through, God, their personal walk through God's word? Would you do that today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So my vision today is to stir a longing for you to study your Bibles. Um, And I I could do that in different ways. I could have maybe said, let's get practical and let me show you some methodologies or some ways to do that. And that's very important. But I really want, in a sense, um, to to awaken you that there is a coordinated effort going on right now. And the Bible says that Satan right, wants to blind the eyes from seeing the glory of God in the face of Christ. And I read this in Amos, and it really kind of like awakened something in me. There is a prophecy that there will be a time coming. It says, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. And it's not a famine for bread or thirst for water, but rather for hearing words of the Lord. And This is something that just really struck in me as I was preparing this week, that we need to be careful that we do not have this famine in us of really not desiring the word of the Lord, that we don't have this kind of passive way about us, about interacting with God's word. And um, as a way of introduction, I want to focus today, as you saw in the title, Jesus in the Bible, and I'm going to just look at Christ today. In our passages and in our text, he will be the main lens that will walk us through um, this sermon today. What did he think of the Bible? Have you ever thought about that? What does Jesus think about the Bible? How did Jesus interact with the Bible? How did Jesus use the Bible? How did he apply the Bible? All of these things have been just in my heart for a few weeks thinking about, wow, how does Jesus interact with the scriptures himself what is his attitude Uh, how did he you know deal with it and there's so many things I wish we could get into everything I've studied but I can't but these are questions I hope that will help us today and so there's three points today the Bible is about functional authority it ultimately is about functional authority the Bible is about heart transformation and number three the Bible is about a person and I want to pull from the two texts that we were in these these three truths the bible's about functional authority it's about heart transformation and it's about a person so let's go on that journey together and i hope that you will be inspired to dig into the wonderful resource you have which is god's word the bible is about functional authority and you see that in mark chapter 7 that whole passage is about authority isn't it isn't that whole passage about authority <clears throat> Jesus is challenging their view of scripture, right? The way that they've interacted with it, the way that they've dismissed it. There was principles, there was things that they were called to do, but somehow human tradition, human interaction has diluted that. And really what's going on in that section is really one about authority. And you see that with this thing highlight about purification practices and I'm not going to take you all into that but where in the Old Testament are we asked to wash our hands well guess who's asked the priests are asked and they're asked in a very specific time in a specific location and in a specific way as a symbol and also I think in a practical way to wash their hands okay There's this biblical principle, this biblical mandate, wash your hands. Well, the Pharisees had taken that and added hundreds of ways to wash your hands. And you saw in the passage, it even talked about washing a couch and washing dishes and washing certain things. Why? 
because they had said, imagine if you went to the marketplace and you touched something that a Gentile had touched. Oh no, all right, you need to wash your hands. Or if you had somebody who maybe brushed up against somebody who was unclean and then they sat on your couch. Okay, we need to clean our couch, okay? So they had this massive layered over the top purification, you know, system. And so they were challenging Jesus and his disciples as they were eating grain saying, did they wash their hands? Well, that was a man-made expectation. And you even see them challenge Jesus and says, why do they not do things according to the tradition of the elders? So what really bothered them was a tradition of elders, not what? The, the mandate of God's word. And you also see it in this Corbin tradition, which is, you say, what does that mean? So this is what's going on. You know, it's the right thing for us to take care of our parents, right? If, if they're not able to take care of themselves, our, our, your children should be the first ones on the line of saying, let's figure out how to take care and honor our parents. And so what had happened is people didn't want their property to be divided and that money given to mom and dad or they didn't want to give certain assets or, or you know, things that, that, that mattered to them. And so what they did is they came up with this system called Corbin. And what they would do is they would say, you know, I have this 40 acres over there by the river. It's my prime location he owns three of them, that one I'm going to Corbin. So when mom and dad come to me and say, hey, you need to step up and be a kinsman and take care of us and honor us, you know, we need food on the table, of course he would have to divest some of his assets to take care of his mom and dad, and he would say, but I can't give you the 40 acres by the river. Oh, why not? Because it's been Corbin. I've dedicated that property to God. If you'd like to, you can go look in the Old Testament and find this Corbin concept, but you won't find it. It was literally a tradition of men, and Jesus calls them out and says, the principle is for you to step up to the plate and be honorable to your mom and dad, and you have devised a system so that you cannot follow through with that principle. So, basically what you kind of see is a point here. Jesus basically summarizes and he says, if you fail to honor the unique authority of the Bible, you fail to worship God. That's basically what he challenges to these folks. He says, because you are not allowing the authority of God's word to function in your life, it's not just a matter of something practical. It's not a matter of, you know, this is not good living. You're actually failing to worship God. Because you're not putting God in his rightful place, in his rightful place. And so he literally equates two things here. He says, if I'm really going to worship God, then guess what? I have to be under authority of God. And that's why when somebody claims to pursue Christ or want to honor God and say, well, there's parts of my life that I will not let God have a say I'm not going to let him have a say in my marriage. I'm not going to let him have a say in how I run my business. I'm not going to let him have a say in this or that. That person is not just having an authority problem. He's having a worship problem. And this is what Jesus highlights and brings about. And I think it's important that as we see that this point is being made, that you and I begin to see Jesus' view of Scripture. That you and I begin to go, okay, so this is how Jesus comes to this conclusion. He comes to this point. He talks about this authority about God's word, but it also becomes a platform for you and for me to see Jesus' view on scripture. Jesus Christ's <coughs> view of scripture was the linchpin on which his entire life was based. <coughs> I want you to know that Jesus has such a high view of the word of God. I think just to meditate or to study it would actually be quite shocking to you. To see how much the Word of God ruled in his life. And, and, and um, I, I didn't, maybe I'll put it on Facebook. Maybe, Terry, you can help me put this article later. But there was a wonderful article about J Jesus and the inerrancy of Scripture. And the way that Jesus interacted with the Word of God, he believed the Word of God was even supreme to his own miracles. And there's so many things there, and it's so important to you. 
This is one little phrase, man, if you just began to say, I'm going to study the Gospels and look up every time this is said, you would be shocked. Jesus often would start his connection to the Word of God or his interaction with the Word of God with, Gepatrai, it is written. And Jesus was always using that phrase. Jesus based all of his thinking, all of his actions, even his heart on the Bible, his mind, will, and emotions, everything was connected to the Word of God. The other day, Preston was saying, uh, it's amazing to think, and it's hard to comprehend, because we were reading out of Hebrews uh, 1, 1 through 4, but that Jesus says that he never did anything of his own accord. So everything you ever read in the Gospels, it was not Jesus doing it. He was following the Spirit. He was responding to the Father's commands and wishes. It's an amazing thought. But connected so closely with that was that Jesus based everything he did upon the Word of God. Think about that. The Son of God submitted himself to the Word of God. It's a pretty, pretty amazing thought. So, what is Jesus' view of Scripture? I told you he had his mind and his actions and even his will, his emotions, subjugated to Scripture. It's pretty amazing. So, there's many examples. I, I really could have, like, been here for weeks if I wanted to. But I just want to give you some examples of his view of Scripture. And we read in Matthew chapter 5, right? That was the other parallel passage that Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Not a letter or a part of a letter will pass away from the word of God till it all comes true. And that's what it means by jot and tittle. That's the Old uh, Testament, sorry, the KJV kind of old language. But even like a seraph, right? Like a, a part of a letter, the way it's written, or a dot, Everything that the scripture has given to us will be fulfilled. <coughs> and so Jesus' view of scripture was very, very high. Not a letter, not a part. Everything will come to pass. Everything will have its say. Everything will be ultimately fulfilled. So when Jesus is thinking about the word of God, he is submitting himself to the fact that the word of God will be fulfilled. Right? In spite of whether he wanted a different outcome, the word of God will ultimately win out. Jesus was subject, he really was, to fulfilling the law, not abolishing it. He wanted to go, think, for things to go according to the predetermined pattern that was set. And so Jesus' view of scripture in his mind was, I'm fulfilling everything. I'm here to see it to its completion, to its full state. So, how about Jesus' view of Scripture in his actions? So, we know where he, what he thinks intellectually, but how about when he was acting out, when he was making a decision, when he was, you know, going through? Well, Matthew 26 is the arrest of Christ. And that's a very dramatic scene. Imagine soldiers coming, and Judas comes, and he gives you the kiss, and there's a pulling and a tugging and tension and people are overwhelmed. And so what, what happens there? Jesus is just going to let things play out or does he say, no, 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 things have got to go a certain way. And if you know the story, Matthew 26, he says to Peter, put down your sword. I can call legions of angels. And then when he says or gives his justification on why he's telling him not to fight, and not to, to defend him, he literally says, how will the scripture be fulfilled? You cannot do this, Peter. The scripture must be fulfilled. So I love your intentions, and I love your heart, and I love your passion, but you need to stop. Why? Because there's something more supreme than your love for me, and that is the scripture must be fulfilled. Guys, I'm gonna take you on a journey in just a little bit to show you just, just how significant these things are. When, when things are unstable and topsy-turvy and uncomfortable, Jesus is thinking about Scripture and about that Scripture being fulfilled and about things going according to the Word of God. 
So how about Jesus' view of Scripture when it comes to his, his emotions or his will? And really there is no better place, right, to go than him carrying the cross. Would you go to this passage, please? Because I think, I think you will be surprised in many ways to see how Jesus interacts with the Word of God here. So in Luke chapter 23, go to verse 28. He's been slapped. He's been beat. He's been tortured. He's been publicly shamed. He's been mistreated. He's been drugged, you know, in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. in the morning. So all kinds of terrible things have happened to Christ. And now <coughs> he is carrying the cross. <coughs> and what we have preserved in the word of God for us, the scene that God wants to reveal to us is found here in verse 28. I'll start there at 26. And they led him away. They seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. And watch what Jesus does. In this moment of being led away to be crucified and the crowds and the passion. I'm just trying to play out like just how over the top and look what comes out of Christ. And turning to those women, Jesus said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and on the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Now, I'm not here to expound on that passage, but guys, that is an amazing thing. He's about to be slaughtered, and what he thinks to do is to speak to these ladies and what comes out of him. Some type of advice about, you know, his personal opinion. of No, what comes out of him is the word of God. That is what is dictating his mindset, his actions, his emotions is I need to give you the word of God. And if we're not convinced that the word of God is so over the top filled in this person, Christ, how about the crying from the cross? What is being cried out? What would you cry out in the midst of suffering and pain and agony? What would come out of you? And we know Psalms 22, verse 1 comes out of him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or we see Psalm 31, 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Listen, folks. At the bottom moments of life, and some of you have, ha have had bottom moments of life, what comes out of you is whatever is in you. At the bottom moment of your life, whatever comes out of you, that is what's in you. And that can be a positive or a negative thing, right? You know, sometimes when you're just like, you're done, you're tired, you're through, and you're finally thinking about making that phone call to your sister and letting her have it after 20 years, right? Oh my word, that kind of shows you like, oh, there's some stuff in you at the very bottom that you need to deal with. But look at the positive stuff here that's in Christ. What comes out of him when he has his life being wrung out? It's the word of God. Does that not stick out to you as so significant? What would come out of you if the bottom came out of your life? What counsel would you give to somebody at the very moment of like you being unraveled, your world, your everything, what counsel would you give to somebody else? I am moved and I'm so impressed that Jesus gives scripture. Significant. Because in Jesus' mind, the scripture has functional authority in his life. In Jesus' mind and demonstrated in his life, it wasn't about the fact that he knew information in the Bible. No, 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 no. The Bible had functional authority in his life. 
Peter, put that sword away. Why? The scriptures must be fulfilled. What matters is the word of God. What matters is what God has said, not whatever I desire or I prefer or my opinion. What matters is, thus saith the Lord. And that is an important thing. Do you search the scriptures with that kind of mindset of, I read the word of God because it's going to have functional authority in my life. I go to the word of God because it's going to determine for me how I make this decision, how I move throughout life, how I respond to this. I read the word of God and it has functional authority in my life so that whatever it says, I will do. Folks, most people don't live there. Most people do not read the word of God and say, whatever it says, I will do. They tend to go to the word of God with a very different agenda. One where they are in the driver's seat. Hey, I really need help in my marriage. I really need help (coughs) in my dating life. I need this, I need that. And they go to God not with this mindset of it will have authority in my life, but is there anything there that can benefit me? And that approach is not right. Because as you search the scriptures the right way, what you're gonna find out is that the scripture will search you. If you come to the scripture with the right mindset, all of a sudden, guess what? The scripture is searching you. It becomes a mirror. As Juan read, it's profitable for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. Like before you know it, you're not coming to the word of God just because I need help. You're coming to the word of God. Why? Because it needs to do something in me. I have a void. I have limited understanding. I will not make sense of life. The scriptures are needed for me to be able to know how to move forth. And so that is very closely connected to the second point. See, the scripture is about functional authority in your life. And it's about heart transformation. It's not about information, but transformation. And you saw that, again, in the passage that we had just read, Mark chapter 7, (coughs) verses 6 and 7. It's actually, he's quoting Isaiah 29. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from, from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. And what God is after and what Jesus reminded those Pharisees that day, he's like, your hearts are a thousand miles away from the God you claim to serve. You don't even approach the scriptures with integrity or a desire for what he is ultimately after. Longing for a heart. I want you to know when you see that, when you see that God desires not so much a sacrifice but a rent heart a torn heart a sensitive heart when you see that God is desiring your heart transformation what he's really longing for is a relationship with you so when you read that all over the scriptures and you say okay God wants my heart God wants you know who I am at the bottom to love him and desire him and to be transformed by him What he's really desiring is a relationship with you. And you need to be encouraged by that. God wants to be close to you. And the way that he's going to be close to you is when you allow the word of God to transform your heart. I want to obey the Bible. Why? Because I want intimacy with God. A lot of people obey the Bible. And I, I know this is... When someone first maybe is a Christian, I can maybe have this conversation with them, but after a few years and after they get off of milk and start eating the meat of God's word, I would challenge them. If they said, I want to obey just so things will go well with me, I'll go, oh, you need to obey so that you can have intimacy with God. That is a higher purpose (laughs) than than things just turning out the way you would like in your life. And this is no new thing. I want to read Juan read Psalms 119. I want to just show you how God is after the heart. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him. 
with their whole heart. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. He's not saying, Lord, teach me these things and then I'm going to just eat gravel and I will obey. But it's okay because then things turn out the way I want. No, 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 no. God, give me your law. Give me your commands. Why? So that I can observe them with my whole heart. I have stored up your word in my heart. Why? So that I might not sin against you. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. I find my delight in your commandments. Imagine that, delighting in commands, which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. I had a friend one time who had a low view of God's word. Somehow God had done that in his life. He didn't read it. He, he, he barely touched his Bible. And what he did, he just said, I'm going to memorize Psalms 119. And I'm hoping that as I memorize that, that God would awaken a desire in my life to love his word. What, a, what, a, what an endeavor. See, because God is not about us just having information. He's about us having transformation. God wants to change you and I into the image of Christ, of his dear son. And he's just not going to do that with information, right? It's not just here are the facts, do it. No, God is going to work and change our hearts and I want you to know <coughs> my challenge for somebody who, who just, who at times can re, seem to be reading God's word and not changing. You know, guys, there are people that I know that they get up every morning, they read, they have their reading plan, but then you look at their life and something's broken. The grace is not there and the, the melted heart is not there and the, the, the repentance is not there. And you're like, this person is faithful and they, they read that passage and they go through it and they're more disciplined than you are. What's the difference? Well, I would say it's not a new problem. We see this in the Gospels. You have to watch your motives. You believe that it's the study of Scripture and your knowledge of Scripture that is going to get you favor with God. Someone who's in that kind of plateau, kind of stuck, why do you read the Bible? Why do you long to get it? Well, if I read the Bible, then things are going to get good with me and God. He'll work things out. This is another passage. I almost preached this passage, but in John chapter 5, <coughs> he's challenging the Pharisees there. And he's telling them that you're not accepting of me. You're not receiving me. You're not embracing me. And this is a huge problem because my father is the one that sent me. So he's having this conversation with them. And we are talking now. When I said earlier, maybe there's a man who wakes up every morning and he reads his Bible faithfully. He put many of you to shame, right? But though he's getting a lot of information in his life, he's not having a lot of transformation, right? Why? Because it's the motive of why you're doing it. And so Jesus challenges the Pharisees and he says to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it's them that bear witness about me all the word of God bears witness about me yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life how can somebody and I promise you these Pharisees would put us all to shame in their commitment their dedication their their knowledge of those scriptures they would memorize the whole Pentateuch y'all Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They would memorize that. Know it word for word. Yet what? They search the scriptures because I'm going to get a benefit from God. I'm in it for myself. And when the scriptures are all about Christ, they rejected him. Watch your motives, folks. Watch your motives. If truly the scriptures... Jesus says is about transformation and if you're stuck in your reading or in your growth why it's probably your motive it's the why why do you do it and I think my third point can be a real key to unlocking the power of God's word in your life and Jesus would not have shied away from this the Bible is about a person 
The Bible is about a person. <coughs> Jesus would never have said the Bible is all about facts and principles and promises. They're contained therein. But ultimately, the Bible is about a person. We cannot only miss the purpose of the scriptures, which is heart transformation, but we can also miss the point. What is the point of the scriptures ultimately? Jesus Christ is the point of the Bible. I want you to know this. Jesus Christ is the ultimate point of the Bible. And I've had some people just, it seems to me over the years, when I've helped them kind of read the Bible or kind of open up, this was the key that unlocked the door. When they realize that they're not turning to the Bible for just a promise or a principle or a practice, but when they would say, God, I'm going to open the word of God today as we sang to show us Christ. God, I'm going to read the word today so that I can know Jesus better. It is like a key that can unlock the word of God in your life. And I don't mean, I think the promises are, are important. I think, you know, when we studied Hebrews chapter 11, right, you need to know the promises of God. You need to be able to run to them and hold on to them. And even I remember Juan preached, it wasn't so much about the promise, but the one who keeps the promise. And that's what the promise is there. It's just a pointer for you to go, all of God's promises find their yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Like, I, you should never read a promise and park it there. Oh, it's going to go good with me. Oh, great, this is going to help me raise my children. Thank you, Lord. The promise is just like a stepping stone for you to see the glory of Christ in that promise. And we are called to read the scriptures to find a person. And Jesus is that point. The purpose of the Bible is a person. I just wanted to rephrase, <coughs> rephrase that for you. The purpose of the Bible is a person. And this leads to... You and me, we see it in this snippet, but we see it in other places. You, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You search the scriptures daily so you can get eternal life? Are you kidding me? It's about me. And you're refusing me. I'm just standing right in front of you. And you refuse me because the scriptures are about Christ. The purpose of the Bible is a person. And I'm, so I'm going to unpack Get, getting to know someone in a relationship. So I just feel like th this is just something that you really need to embrace. I'm reading the Bible. I'm getting to know a person. Guys, this is how you would make or have a journey of getting to relate to anybody in life. So what do I mean by that? See, when you get to know somebody, you naturally are going to begin to go, what do you like? What do you dislike? What are your dreams? What are your desires? Tell me about yourself. And as you are entering that relationship with somebody, you are growing in your awareness of who they are and what, what, what they long for. And you definitely are not going to do things that would bother them on purpose, unless you're Juan. And he likes to do that for his wife. But, you know, in a relationship... <coughs> You, you don't do things that annoy that other person on purpose, right? You might do it for fun, right? Juan and Rachel have fun. But you wouldn't do it every day on purpose. Why? Because you want a relationship with that person. You, you want them to be eventually, you know, your, in a sense, beloved. And one of the things that happens as you go on a relationship journey with somebody, you begin to limit your choices and freedoms. You naturally begin to say no to things out of a complete motivation of pleasing your beloved. So I, I'm going to take this out of my life. I'm going to take this other thing out of my life. I won't do this. Why? Because I'm growing in a relationship with you. And what begins to happen which is a scary thing, all moms know this, but you're only happy if they're happy. And so what happens is your happiness now is beginning to be mingled with their happiness. And this is what happens in a relationship. I'm losing my freedoms, I'm not getting this independence that I want, but I'm developing a relationship. 
And oh my word, I'm starting to see that even my happiness is tied up in your happiness. What is going on here? See, the purpose of the Bible, the purpose of the Bible is a person. And if you would approach the Bible, you would see that Jesus said, I have come to fulfill this law. I've not come to abolish it. And if you really want to get to know me, and if you really want to have a relationship with me, you need to read the scriptures and find out what I like, what I don't like, what I enjoy, what I don't enjoy, what I'm all about, what's my agenda, what's my purpose, what's my mission, what's my goal. And that's how reading the word of God mingled with heart transformation, mingled with the fact that it's a person that you're pursuing, makes the Bible begin to click. And it's not merely information, but transformation. And I wanted to just park here, I can't go into it, but one of the things you will find is you say, okay, I'm going to study this person. All right, you convinced me, Chago. I'm going to read the Bible with a focus on a person. And what you will be amazed by, and we're just barely touching <laughs> this wonderful concept, you will find out that Jesus is the sacrifice, that he is the temple, he is the law, he's the ordinance, the type, the pointer, the promise, the destination, the shadow, the fulfillment of it all. And as you read the word of God, you will find out, oh my word, there's so much more to this person than I could have ever imagined. I love listening during this time of the year. Now, sometimes do it other times of the year. But I just, I listen to the Andrew Peterson album, Behold the Lamb of God. I will try not to listen to that album unless I listen to the beginning all the way to the end. But my heart leaps for joy every time I listen to that. Because I'm taken on a journey a journey about a king who came down and he made people and he made this garden and he had beautiful fellowship with them. But those people that he loved messed up and all of a sudden a plan was made and he was have to, gonna have to figure out how to win the people that he loves back to himself. And so then we, later on we see a guy named Moses and he's told to build a temple and it has the dimensions of that garden. And it's very specific. And Jesus comes down in glory, the Bible says, and he fills that place so that he can have fellowship and so they can get a little bit of a foretaste of what this God is wanting to have with these people. A little foretaste of, I want to be for you these things. But those people mess up again and again. And we move very quickly through and there's disappointment in human kings and in human establishments and this and that and everyone is kind of sick of themselves and they finally come to a place where they say, okay God, we'll do it your way. Send this Messiah. How long, O oh Lord, are you going to not keep your promise? You said he would come from us and he would be established and he would make all things right and then Jesus shows up. The king does show up, and he's an unusual king. No one even recognizes him or looks at him or thinks about him, and he lives this beautiful, perfect life that we have in the Gospels. He never thought a bad thought. Have you ever thought about that? He never, ever had ill will. He never had a sinful thing, and he lived beautifully and perfectly, and he, he gave himself every opportunity right to experience what we experience he was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin and so he is the perfect lamb and he finally is prepared to be put on a cross and he is slaughtered for your sin and for my sin and the veil was torn in two that curtain was torn in the temple, giving us a picture that we now have access to God. The one who wanted to have access with us in the garden. And now he's given us a foretaste of that. We can have fellowship with God because we have a mediator who is Christ the Lord. 
and his spirit resides within us. And we get little taste of that in our life where we go, oh, this is what sweet fellowship is like with this person who wants a relationship with me. And not only did he keep his promise and come one time, oh, he's gonna come again. He's gonna come again and he's gonna set everything right. And we go to Revelations 21 and read some of the most sweetest things. And he's gonna establish his kingdom again. And he's gonna rule and reign and there will be no need for the sun or for the moon because Jesus is in the midst of us who is the light. And he will wipe away every tear from their eye. This is the person that is revealed to us. I did it in three minutes from Genesis to Revelations. This is the person in the scriptures that you and I can get to know. Man, I want to motivate you. <coughs> Do you really want Jesus? Do you really want Jesus? I really believe that this is the thing that turns your desire to know the word or to read the word or to engage in the word is because you really want a relationship with Christ. You cannot know Jesus and obey Jesus Christ unless you obey his doctrine of scripture. All I wanna say is that you can't tell me I love Jesus, but my view of his word is it's, it's got problems. I don't like what it says about homosexuality. I really struggle with this and that. Look at, then you have no relationship with Jesus. You don't, because you have to take the same view that Jesus had of the word and what he believed. And if you're really gonna have a relationship with Christ, if you're really gonna have a relationship with the word of God, it's gotta contradict you every once in a while. I know I used to teach this a lot a long time ago, but if you're reading the Bible and you're walking away and saying, this is all pleasant for me, this is wonderful information. I'm really into this numbers thing. Did you, whatever. But the word of God never contradicts you. It never checks you. It never rebukes you. Guys, that's not a relationship at all. Because a real relationship will have people that at times don't see eye to eye. If you don't have a Jesus who contradicts you, then I will challenge you. You've made up a Jesus that's not in the Bible. Because a real relationship, right, will have these things. And if you're not going to let God contradict you through his word, because it's a real relationship, and at times say, hey, you, you need to stop lying. You need to start having integrity. You need to start putting me first place. You need to start serving here. Okay, that's great that God pushes back on those areas because we all need them. But guess what? If you don't let him contradict you, then you're never going to do it in the positives either. When your heart fails you, God is greater than your hearts. Are you going to let the word of God contradict you when you look at your life and you look at your finances and you look at your brokenness and say, I give up? Or are you going to go, nope, he who began a good work in me is going to be faithful to complete it. God, contradict me right now because I want to give up. But your word is greater than even my heart. And because I have a relationship with you, you get to push back and throw this promise in my face and I'm just gonna submit to it. And I'm gonna let that promise have authority in my life right now. Okay. I know I've been talking a lot about you adjusting to God and him contradicting you and you getting to know him. <coughs> so where is God adjusting to me? Isn't a relationship a two-way street, Chago? It is. And I want to show you that God has actually adjusted greatly for you. Jesus so wanted a relationship with you. He so wanted you to be a part of his family, for you to be his brother and his sister, and to have a heavenly father. Jesus said, I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to go into that cosmic hell. But what does he do? He adjusts and he says, not my will be done, but thine. God, you, the Father, get to call the shots in this relationship. Why does he do that? Jesus adjusted his life to us in the most radical possible way. Why? Because he wants a relationship with you. 
And when you adjust your life and when you're called to take this out of your life and to add this into your life and to make this change, it's because I want a relationship with you. And Jesus has been the trailblazer, the model of taking on the form of a human, a lowly human person. And as Daniel said last week, a powerless, vulnerable, weak, little baby. In some ways, it just feels so dishonoring, does it not? Why does he do these things? He takes on the form of a servant and is obedient even unto the death on a cross. Why? To have a relationship with you. Because he wants you. God wants you. God wants you. More than you could ever imagine. Not just that the cross tells us that, but the word of God is literally written because he wants you. He don't, doesn't want to just give you marching orders, principles to apply to your life. He's like, no, 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 no. You're going to do these things and you and I are going to have a relationship. I want to encourage you today. Get into the word in 2021. Read it. Let it have authority in your life. Let it transform your heart. And I hope at the end of 2021 that you can say, I know Jesus way better than I did last year. That's why we are given the word of God. And so let's take advantage of that wonderful gift. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for your word today. I thank you for the gift of it. Lord, I do pray <coughs> for people, God, now. Um, I'm going to pray for those who maybe have not realized that everything in the word and everything that God is doing and everything that God is making happen is because he wants a relationship with them. And so God, whether it's somebody here physically or somebody at home, would you help them realize, God, and be awakened today that God wants them. God wants them. He wants a relationship with them. He wants them in his family. He wants to delight in them and enjoy them. And so would you just let them know that they can trust in what Jesus has done on the cross for them. They can place their faith in that, put their hope there, and know that a real relationship is possible for them. And now, God, for your believers, those who claim to know you, who have a relationship with you, God, you know my heart's desire today was just to make them aspire to excite them to go, I'm gonna get into the word. Because there's a person to know. And there's a person there who slaughtered himself so that I could know them. And the word was given and became flesh so I can have real heart transformation. And I pray, God, that the scriptures would be elevated in their life and that they would grow in your word more than ever. And may they say with the psalmist that it is a delight, a delight to know the word of God. Do that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.